I'm Melvin Gibbs. In addition to being a musician, I also have a bit of history as an artist advocate. I'm a former president of a organization that was called uh, Content Creators, which is now called the Artists, uh, they changed, I forget what the new name is, the Art Artist something or other. <laughs> uh, it'll come to me eventually, I told you I'm underprepared. But uh, over the years I've done things like go speak in DC about copyright, the organization was one of the organizations that helped get the uh, Music Modernization Act passed, which you guys may or may not know about. But I'm going to keep it really big picture because I do know a lot of you and I kind of know that I can. there's some kind of general things you got to think about when you're thinking about dealing with the internet. Um, one of the things I always say to people is that the important thing, what, the most important thing to understand about dealing with the internet is that Internet businesses are based off of two big ideas, aggregation and scale. To get it, have a successful internet business, you put a whole bunch of things, you try to aggregate, which means you try to grab things what, in whatever realm you're in. You try to grab things in that realm, whether it's video games or shoes or whatever. You try to put as many things together in one place as you can, and then you try to scale, which means you try to take your little thing and make it huge. Why that's important is because it sets a certain, it, it puts a certain logic to how a, an internet business goes, which means the logic is you're trying to have the biggest business possible. And to have the biggest business possible, that means there can't be any other businesses. So at the end of the day, it means that every internet company is trying to be a monopoly. So that's the first thing that you have to wrap your head around when you're thinking about these businesses. Because their goal is to get everything in whatever realm they happen to be in. So us as musicians, all of these companies have the same goal. They're trying to get as much as they can. The second important thing you have to think about when you're thinking about these businesses is that, uh, how can I put this? They are not driven by profit. They are driven by the idea, they are driven by the idea of scale. They, they make their money by what's called an IPO, initial public offering. They make their money by selling equity. What that means for us on the street is they don't make money on paper. So how that plays out is if they have to pay us, they are paying us from the profit side, not the equity side. So they will always say, because they're always never making a profit, they always don't have any money. So it would, all, it would always look like whatever money they need to, to spend to give for what they call content, I mean, you know, whatever they have to, they will try to, they will, even if they have to pay for it, they will claim that this, will, this impacts their profit margin of which they have none, which means, long story short, they can't afford to pay. That's how, that's how it plays out. So you have to understand these basic parameters of what's going on in these businesses from the standpoint of what these businesses are trying to do. Of course, the question is, what are we as musicians trying to do? So on a practical level, And it's interesting talking about housing and talking about having to think about things as a worker and this old paradigm of, you know, that goes back to the 40s of the New Deal and you have to think, you have to fit into this box where you're an employee and you hit the mark and, the, you know, and that's, the, that's the, the pool, that's the way of thinking that allows you to interface with that system. When you're interfacing with the internet world and the digital system, whether you like it or not, 
think of it as a thought experiment that you don't that, that it's not you as a person. You must think like a business person and an entrepreneur. You must think in terms of profit and loss. And you must learn how to listen to what you're being, what's being told to you in terms of profit and loss. I mean, Mark, Mark Rebo always, always had, Mark Rebo had a great thing he used to say, who was, Mark was the, per, was the previous president of the arts organization that I'm a part of. He used to talk about the fact that you will pay $10,000 to make a record that will make back two or $300, right? <laughs> So at that, that, there is no, that is not how a business person would operate. That is how a hobbyist would operate. So the question becomes for us as musicians is how do we, what, is, what, is, what does business look like for us? So I'm going to kind of go off track here. Uh, thinking in terms of how you interface with, no, I'm going to stay on track. I'm going to go off switch topics. Thinking in terms of how you ace face with the internet, start to think about it in terms of how does it work for you as a business. We had, uh, Diane earlier was talking, she was head of marketing. She was, she's a marketer. Think about it, think about uh, Think about profit, think about the different parts you have of a business. Think about when it's appropriate for you to use the internet in a way that is not profitable for you. And learn how to not listen. I, I mean, I always say people, learn how to not listen to the advice you're given about the internet by people who work in the internet business because their goal is not your goal. They will tell you, you should upload your music to X, Y, and Z. But that's because their goal is to aggregate content to, so they can scale. If you are a person who's in the world we're in, where our world does not scale, some of that information doesn't apply to us. Some of, some of, some of, some, that way of thinking does not apply to us. What does apply to us is the sort of old school thinking about what is distribution, how our, how our, I have to use the capitalist word, how our product gets out there. That's the information that you should listen to and pay attention to. And Gene's gonna give some of that information better. But you, you kinda have to think about this in two boxes, right? When you're thinking about social media and the world of what, what is the term? The platforms, that's the word I'm looking for. When you're dealing with platforms, platfo a platform profits by you giving them content. That is not how you are going to profit. You will profit by distributing your product. I, hate, you know, I have to use the capitalist words here. You will, pro you will profit by distributing your product in a way that allows you to grow your business. So, and there are ways to grow a business in a collaborative way. That's, you know, there, you know, um, thinking about uh, what was it? There are different, you know, if you wanna do it that way, if you wanna get into that, you can, uh, there are, thinking about, uh, I'm trying to be more practical for this thing. All right, let me let me leave that alone. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump ahead. Now we all there's a, another important thing here. The single I'm, I'm, since I'm not the head of an organization that has to uh, negotiate that's part of a what's the word a coalition with other organizations. I can just say to musicians what musicians need to hear. In this era, it's, also, it's, it's something that is a fault of the system that has become a necessity. You must keep ownership of your own stuff at all times. You must keep ownership of your creativity. You must not sign it away. You can sign along with someone, which is the default now anyway in the music business, that they have what's called uh, 
the different terminology for the different artist partnerships. That, well, how that plays out for us is, as Mark said, we end up paying for our own record and we split. If, if we work with a record company, we paid for the record and we split the profits or whatever. But the reason that you must hold on to the ownership is because that's what allows you to negotiate. When you want to negotiate with a streaming service, when you want to negotiate with the distribution service, you, it has to come, you have to be, they have to, you have to force them to give you the information you need to make a decision. Because if you go through someone else, you will not, you will never get, you won't have enough transparency. You won't know what's going on. The only way you can really know what's going, the only way you can force them to tell you what's going on is if it's your property that they have to, to interface with. So those, those are kind of some of the big picture ideas um, in terms of how to think about interfacing with the internet. Because there are 10, there are, there are, there's companies come and go, there's a thousand different ways you can handle uh, distribution, but the, if you want to be able, if you want to be able to actually maneuver in these situations, the overarching things is you have, to, again, to, to repeat, you got to think, you got to accept that you're a capitalist. <laughs> you have to accept that you have to think about your own profit and loss. It's not somebody else's, because the other companies are thinking about theirs, and you have to understand that uh, the platforms see this as a zero-sum thing. You... They make money by you not making money. That's just how it is. That's how that's, it's not, it's not a win-win. It's a win-loss, and you have to understand that. Current, concurrent with that, you have to understand that these platforms have aggregated. Everybody is on these platforms, so there are going to be times when you need to interface with them, and you'll have to decide for yourself how that works for you as a business person. So I guess how this plays out is I've had, just to be concrete, I've had conversations with different people where different people will say, okay, you need to make a Facebook page, you need to do all, you don't need to do it. You need to, what you need to do is figure out what you, what you want to do. And making a Facebook page may be right for you, it may not be right for you. Uh, what will always be, but speaking in terms of pure math, now I'm going to jump a, a, around, and uh, hopefully I'm not stepping on something Gene's going to say later. Uh, what is most profitable to you is what you yourself own. So in other words, if at the risk of sounding like I'm being a salesperson here, I'm just, I'm just talking reality, uh, it may make sense in terms of profit, one CD is equal to how many streams now? Do you know? Do you know, Jay? Uh, 10,000 maybe? Yeah. So I, 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 over 10,000. One CD is, is, is worth more than 10,000 streams. So in terms of think, what? In what sense? Uh, you, how much you get paid? I think you get paid a thousandth, seven thousandth of a, a penny for one stream. Yeah. So, yeah. So, it when you understand that people who make money on the internet are dealing in billions of streams, and we're looking. You guys can go on Spotify, go on Spotify yourself and see what your monthly, what your, you can you can find that information out. You can see that the math might work better for you to think about using the internet in a different kind of way. Think about how you can how you can interface with your people and get them to go to where you are. Whether and one thing I'm go, I'm gonna you know. I'm sorry, this is kind of off the top of the head. This is a very free jazz talk, but <laughs> one thing I would suggest right here, Patricia, is that maybe this organization, this, and this is something I was going to do, maybe we should make a recommendation that people like the Times that when they post our music, they post directly to our band camps and not to our Spotify's. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. 
because that is much more lucrative for us and it doesn't really make a difference for them as long as they can get it online, which becomes the main, goes back to my main point. We are in the 21st century. You have to be able to be found online. What you need to, if you, if you're in, if you want to interface with anybody who's in online or anybody in the media, thinking in terms of how you can make that work best for you is the question. Some people, you know, for this music, uh, streaming the streaming services, even though they're the default now, are not going to be something that's going to be a real income source. It's just facts. But directing people back to your hub, whether it's in Bandcamp or Cash Music or somewhere where, or whether it's your label's uh, hub on the internet, is a much better way of, of, of interfacing with the internet than sending them to a, to a, a Spotify or, or Apple Music. So that's, that's, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm stepping on toes here, but I don't have to worry about that anymore. But the overarching thing is, the, the important thing in this area is you, you have to think like an owner, right? And you have to, that's just, that's just kind of how it is. And you have to decide for yourself which, what is marketing and what is profit. For some people, you know, some people might want to give their music away because they're, they're profiting as a teacher, right? Some people might want to, might want to give away some information because they're profiting as a musician. These are the kind of things you have to think about. And you have, you know, the third, I guess the other thing I should say is for this iteration of life, who knows what's going to happen in five years or ten years, uh, social media platforms are very important. And for those of you who are on social media anyway, maybe some of you aren't, <laughs> Think about that. Think about that as a business place, as opposed to a, a thing you're just talking. To, as as opposed to just something you're doing because everybody else is doing it. Think about how it works for you as a business. And I mean, this is all generalities, but I think that these are these are thing, these these are the kind of generalities that uh, people of of our generation kind of have to take into account. Melvin and I have been working in a similar space um, in the past and that we have very different approaches sometimes. And so I feel like the, I agree with everything that Melvin has said and it's, and, and the, what I appreciate is that the conversation is about kind of like what's gonna be helpful to the people that are in this room. Um, some of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about is gonna be about like, what are some of the challenges if you're gonna try and change the system, which Melvin also has experience with. And so we can go through whatever you guys think is the most useful. But one thing that I would offer um, in advance of me going through a few of my slides, like a lot of it's just about, you know, like why music writers don't understand the musician's perspective. So that's not necessarily a great way to get educated about how the industry works and like what are the actual structural barriers we're looking at when we're looking at how rates are getting set for different kinds of royalties like through streaming services and things like that. I have those kinds of resources as well as research that talks about um, how do musicians really make a living in the United States because we did a big survey a few years back. I used to work with an organization called Future of Music Coalition and we can talk a little bit more about that if that's useful. Um, I actually had like a speech. Like I, w I was just like, I have slides and I have an old speech, so that's here, and so maybe I'll refer to that. But first I wanted to talk about something that Melvin made me think about, which is the 1,000 true fans concept or framework, um, which is, I think, really useful for folks who are trying to figure out how to navigate the music industry, um, because it helps to center because you have so much information coming at you where you've got the platform saying you need to use our platform or else you're not going to be successful, which may or may not be true most of the time. It's not true. But the 1,000 true fans thing I think is a useful frame for everyone, which is that if you focus on finding the 1,000 people in the world who are really going to care about what you do and are going to buy everything that you do, let's say you put out a record in a year and you ask them to pay $20, that's $20,000 that can go direct to you. And that 
success in the music industry doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be on the top 10 or that you're going to get a lot of plays on Spotify or whatever it is. I think that for many people that I've met, success in the music industry means that you can focus on your music and you can feel like it's a relatively sustainable thing that you do, even if it's really hard. And that getting distracted with trying to understand the ins and outs of the industry can sometimes be rewarding, but a lot of times it really isn't. Um, but focusing on the fans, the people who care about you, um, the people who want to know more about what you're doing, what it is that they care about, like why they're drawn to you, if that's something that you're all so excited about, can you build on that? And focusing on like who are the thousand people? You know, maybe it'll end up being more than a thousand people for because you have a group and it's not just a solo thing and you need more than a thousand people to sustain you. But just thinking about um, that kind of a framework I think can be helpful. So that was something I wanted to offer. Um, let me see. So, you know, the speech part's just like five minutes. Should I just run through it and then we can talk about some of the examples of what I have to offer? Is that okay? Okay. Um, so for over a decade, I was on staff at Future of Music Coalition, which is a nonprofit that helps to bring musicians' voices to the table when policy decisions are made that impact their ability to earn a living. Um, so uh, that's, that's me testifying in front of the city council, talking about why net neutrality is important for musicians. In 2015, I don't know if you guys remember any of this, but um, the New York Times did this big feature. Uh, FMC got in a big fight with the magazine about this cover story about creative careers and how they'd been disrupted by technology. And our criticism was not only did the New York Times misinterpret data to fit a convenient narrative about how technology lifted all boats, but they also neglected to seriously examine what was harder for creators now or what hadn't changed at all. So after a series of public letters back and forth between us and the writer, we also saw many other artists groups, including C3, Melvin's group, uh, weigh in on the question. Um, and some researchers got involved and some other artist uh, advocates as well. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, nobody was really clear on how musicians are doing. So you get a lot of people protesting and making a big fight about something, but you're not actually clear on what's useful for musicians to understand their landscape. Um, I don't blame the writer for his mistakes. It's a difficult question to answer how musicians are doing. Uh, we've had to try and answer that question at Future Music Coalition. I'm no longer with FMC, but I was with them for about 10 years um, until just a few years ago. And um, so FMC didn't think that only charismatic personalities and dramatic stories should dominate the debate about how these new business models and changes in copyright law are impacting artists. So storytelling, of course, is a critical tool when you're communicating ideas like that. Um, but FMC believes that uh, actual data had an important role as well. But the good data actually just didn't exist. So an illustration of the what happens when there isn't good data about how musicians are doing is um, uh, a conversation that I had with a journalist, uh, with a well-respected journalist at a newspaper of record who was patiently explaining to me that he thought that there were fewer musicians making a living from, say, classical music than indie rock in the United States. And I thought that was fascinating. I was like, well, what kind of evidence do you have? Was there a study? And he's like, no, it's just a gut feeling that I have. So as far as I can tell, he has little experience with the classical music genre. I don't know that he knows that symphony orchestra musicians are often on salary, that most symphony players also have teaching jobs and actually have pretty sustainable careers. His view of the industry doesn't appear to be particularly shaped by understanding the diversity of the musician experience. And he's not alone. So this is what it looks like in my head when I think about the money that's generated by a musician. And in the corners, you can see that there are uh, fans and the money generated around them, and then all of the different middlemen that the money has to go through before it actually gets to the artist. This is, I feel like, an important point that most journalists don't understand, which is that there's a big difference between all the money that's generated in this whole space and what actually ends up in the musician's bank account. Musicians never get confused about that. Journalists always get confused about that. <laughs> So they're gonna conflate a lot of activity around here with a musician doing really well, when we all know that that may not be the case. Okay, so, uh, and that's actually led to something I feel like culturally is a problem where musicians come, sometimes come out, they come off as like cranky scolds, like you know the first 10 
15 years of Na right after Napster where musicians were just seen as Luddites. Of course, now a lot of folks have come around and realized that maybe the platform shouldn't be so powerful. Maybe that's actually bad for democracy. But you think about the arguments that were being made like maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago by musicians where they're like, well, maybe I don't want to give that much power to a corporation. Everyone's like, just get on the boat. We're headed to this really exciting place. But nobody actually had a clear idea of where they were headed. Um, so that's, that's one of the side side impacts that I think that as musicians that we have to fight against, which is that we're seen as not understanding the landscape or told that, oh, well, what you're talking about, you're trying to make a living, that's actually not as important as this bright big future that we're headed towards and you're just a naysayer. And I think that that also is a distraction from a real conversation about how musicians are doing. Okay, so uh, I've got a bunch of different examples of research that we've done and that we can talk about. I'll just go through them really quick and you're like, oh, this looks interesting. You could raise your hand or something and then I can stop and talk about it. There are a bunch of resources that FMC has available on their website for people who do want to kind of get into the weeds about some of the stuff. Um, so this is an example like the 42 revenue streams where you know that, that chart from before was like all these different ways that people make money. Um, this is the stuff that ends up in people's bank accounts and just trying to understand like what they all are. We made a list. It kept getting bigger and bigger, and so these are examples of that. We use that to do a survey to try and understand how American musicians were doing, um, and this was in 2012. Um, we ended up talking to a lot of different kinds of musicians um, from a lot of different contexts, which was really important because most of the understanding of musicians' experiences tends to be segregated. So like you hear a lot about how the indie rock people are doing, and then, but you might be over on the classical side, you might be on the free jazz side, and you're like, well, how does that really relate to what I'm doing? And so being able to look at everybody all in one place, I think was very illuminating in some ways. We also collected a lot of other data, data about the musicians, um, and all of this is available on the website. And then overall, it was a multi-method thing. So we have a survey, we have personal interviews, and then we have case studies. Um, oh. Uh, so this is the jazz musician income by revenue category. And this is one of those things where it's like touring, salary as an employee of a band or something, session musician, money from songwriting, money from sound recordings, merchandise sales. Can anybody guess what the average income of the people who identified jazz as their primary income in the United States was for, 20, for our 2012 survey? 12,000? Any other guesses? 20? Nine. Nine? <laughs> wow. Okay. 30? 30,000. 30, <laughs> um, and, you know, it's going to be a mix. It's not going to all be people who are doing free jazz. It's probably going to be some people who are doing a mix of other things as well. But, like, when you see how it actually breaks down for those folks, this is the breakdown. Can you see that from back there? I don't know if you can. So, like, for, for teaching, it's like 10,000. Touring, it's like 9,000. Salary as an employee. Maybe it's 3,000 session musicians, about 3,000 composings, like maybe 1,500 sound recordings is like 1,100, that kind of thing. Um, this isn't meant to be like, how is every musician doing? It's, an, you know, it's, a, it's a summary of looking at a lot of different musicians' experiences, but it's more concrete and more real than anything that had been in the dialogue about how are musicians doing in the United States. And I think that that was really valuable. The other thing that we did was we looked at kind of the experiences of people across genres and how different they are. So those categories are also here, and you can see there's jazz, there's classical, rock, country, and hip hop. I'll go through this really fast because I've got a bunch of stuff, and you know some of it's useful, but I'm also happy to send it to you. You can look at it on your own time. Um, but this was just basically demonstrating that the mix of income for different genres is very different. Um, and so when people say that, you know, like this kind of income stream is going to save music, it might save music for some people, but it's not going to save music for other people. We also ask people who's on their team. So like you have a bandmate, but also like do you have an accountant, a booking agent? We found that who's on people's teams differed uh, depending on what kind of genre they're in. So in country music, uh, people were more likely to say like co-writer, booking agent, webmaster, producer. For jazz, it was just bandmate, booking agent, and accountant. But like on urban music, it's bandmate, producer, co-writer, sound person, graphic designer, attorney. So like what the teams look like are different. So that's just another illustration. This is too complicated. I don't think I'll talk about that right now. Um, 
But for people who are nerds about this kind of stuff, and I am, uh, so I'm, I get excited about this, maybe you don't. But if you do, you can go to the website and you can actually access all the survey data and you can ask your own questions of the data. So you can be like, well, how did musicians in Chicago do? And you know, how do, what do full-time musicians look like in this, kind of a, in, in this kind of space? And you can do different filters and stuff on the data to better understand what the experiences were. We also did some case studies um, where we look at in income of actual people. We went through hundreds of pages of like tour receipts and like ASCAP statements, record label statements to try and understand the lives, like how everything fits together for individuals. And so all of that is also, it's, they're anonymous and they're on our website, but this is like a jazz band leader and what their income looks like. Um, and I'm gonna skip through it really fast, but. For band, uh, they're like for band leaders versus sidemen and jazz, the picture looks super different. Like you know, this is something that everybody kind of into really intuits and understands. But something that, if you were to try and find resources that can help guide you through thinking about it, there aren't that many. So this was one of the things that we thought could be helpful. Um, so this is just showing you that there are a lot of case studies. Um, here's another resource that we have which talks about if you care about Spotify, who's at the table when they determine how much artists are going to get paid. Because there are three different ways, uh, three different royalties that are involved with Spotify and so you'd be able to look at like who's representing you, like the major labels set the ceiling for the rates and then there's ASCAP, BMI and CSAC for the composition piece of it and then there's also the NMPA. Um, which is the national publishers, kind of like the major labels as well. Um, and then for iTunes, who's at the table and who determines what's going to, uh, what you're going to get paid. And overall, um, from this presentation, what I think is the important takeaway for artists is just that the different players that are at the table, some of them are going to be more incentivized to be accountable to you than others. And so when you think about who's at the negotiating table on your behalf, who are the good, like what are you looking for? Uh, in, a, in, a, in an intermediary. And so like, do they, do they actually represent artists? Are there artists on their board? Are there artists who can control what their policies are gonna be? Is the rate that they negotiate published or is it secret and protected by NDAs? NDAs don't really do much for artists, but people who are gonna be more transparent about that, like um, the unions, ASCAP, BMI, CSEC, and Sound Exchange, they do publish the rate. Do they offer detailed reporting where you can really know how all of the music was used and in what place? Are they transparent about that? Do they protect the artist's share? A lot of times when there's composition money, um, there might be some of it that goes to a publisher. Uh, if there's uh, sound recording money, a lot of it might go to a label. Um, ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC are great, um, and, as well as Sound Exchange, because they'll collect those streams separately, so that way a label, and this is really getting into the weeds, but like a label, when they you sign a, if you sign a, um, <laughs> contract with them, they're gonna try and get as many of your income streams as they can. A lot of artists don't always know uh, when you're signing, what you're signing away, but these folks know, and so they make sure to protect that, so when it comes in that the label just can't jump in on it. Um, so that's kind of a complicated thing to explain, but just wanted to let you know that protecting the artist's share and making sure that they understand what the artists are supposed to receive because of the way the law is structured is something that folks like Sound Exchange, ASCAP, BMI, and CSEC honor. And labels and the National Publishing Association aren't necessarily going to. So there's a difference between the, uh, the intermediaries that work on your behalf, and these are the kinds of things to look for. Another example of resources that we have available are just kind of like, how does the money flow? So like for broadcast radio, when money comes in for artists, like how do the composers get paid? How do the individual artists get paid? Um, for webcasting, all the different platforms, they're all completely different systems, um, and they use different kinds of intermediaries, and it's very complicated, so I'm just going through it really fast, but just the point is just that if you wanted to know this kind of stuff, and you may not want to, and I don't blame you, but that stuff has been explained from an artist perspective, and it is available to you. And another one is looking at new business models in music and how they do for different kinds of artists, the side-by-side -side comparison. Another example is a music and money quiz. If this kind of thing gets you excited and you want to test your knowledge, this is a way to do it because it'll kind of educate you about different kinds of questions around copyright. And um, oh, and then I have this last thing which is written out that I can read. So, um, and then I'll sit down and 
me and Melvin can answer questions, right? One of the most difficult challenges for musician compensation and attribution in the digital space is about ensuring that the information and the money flows don't just work in the biggest pipes between the major labels and the music services, that it doesn't just work for Taylor Swift, that it also works for us, kind of further down the tail. Um, through the smaller pipes, through the last mile, this is what we call the last mile, kind of like, you know how when they're like getting water for a city or they're giving internet to a city, they, they always make sure like the biggest corporations are able to get their water and their electricity or whatever it is. And the last mile is like everyone else. Like, you know, how do you make sure that the poorer neighborhoods or the less popular areas of the city are also getting the same services that everybody's supposed to get? Everyone agrees that the poor, uh, poor neighborhoods are supposed to be able to get these services, but nobody wants to think that it's their responsibility. It's the same kind of problem in music, where making sure that your information is correct so you can actually receive your royalties, um, making sure that uh, the follow-up um, that's necessary to make sure that you're plugged into the places that are supposed to be giving you money. Everyone agrees that it should happen. Nobody's working on it. They work on it for the big artists. They don't work on it, on it for our communities. And so that's what I think is like big picture, like the biggest problem that we've encountered that I just wanted to kind of let you know, like, you know, if you think about like Spotify, Spotify rates are bad. It's like, okay, yeah, they're bad, but I would be so much, so I wouldn't care so much about their rates if they were more transparent about different kinds of things. And they worked to make sure that artists could plug in and actually get the money that they're complaining that they're not, you know, that, that isn't high enough. And so FMC's approach was research, then education and advocacy. And they encourage more transparency in the system and explaining how things work, whether it's who's at the table when Spotify royalties are calculated or how the money flows in the music industry or mapping out the royalty and metadata chains, which sounds really wonky, but like is important to understand if you actually want to get paid in any of these systems um, or what legislation is moving. And um, these investigations will provide musicians and advocates with the tools that they would need to seek better solutions that work for everyone. And then, can I just say one other thing, which is gonna take two minutes, um, which is kind of a framework, and we can also sit down while, while I'm doing that um, and start to take questions. And then the last thing is how I think about the music ecosystem, and this is gonna, can, gonna be from kind of like an equity perspective, which is, um, I read an article recently by uh, Sarah Cliff, who's a health insurance writer, and she was talking about like the, the failure of the healthcare system is that it places the patient in the center but it also d is completely dependent on the free labor that's provided by the patient to make the system work. So if you have to go to the pharmacy and they mess up your prescription, the pharmacy doesn't call your doctor, you call the doctor and you sort it out. If the insurance doesn't quite figure out like how to deal with your specialist's bill, you're the per person who goes back and forth between the insurance and the specialist. And then you have to follow up with the insurance like three months later when they get it wrong. Um, these silos, in the industry are incentivized not to work together and serve patients better because their business model is that patients are incentivized to do the work. I think about the music uh, landscape and individual artists in a very similar way. We see these silos of organizations and platforms and new services. They're all like, oh, well, the musician's incentivized to do that. The musician's incentivized to tell us the names of the tracks and who played on what and who, who did all the engineering for this thing. The musician's incentivized to, you know, if their music's being used on, on YouTube and, and they don't want it to be used that way, the musician's incentivized to file the DMCA takedown notices again and again and again. And the musician's gonna be incentivized to register their work at the copyright office so that way they can get compensation when somebody's exploiting it in a way that they don't want them to. And the musician's gonna be incentivized to submit their own records for the Grammys. Or a musician's gonna be incentivized to submit for the Pulitzers, which, you know, that's something you have to submit for, who knew? Um, or, or like tell ASCAP what you played on so you can get paid, but tell them the splits. Like tell them how you're splitting up the money that's coming to you, which requ requires like support and negotiation and uh, an ability, uh, frameworks to think about like where you can have hard conversations with your band about how you wanna split up the money. Musicians don't have support in that way and they're the free labor that basically kind of makes the industry work. And I think what's really problematic about that is that it incentivized the industry to become more and more complex because the more complex it is, the fewer people are gonna show up and say, hey, you're supposed to pay me for that. It also is an, an equity issue for me because like, who can afford to participate in a system that's that complex and requires so much free labor and specialized knowledge, right? So it's people who have access to capital and it's people who have access to connections and support. 
Um, and there's something really wrong about a system that's like that, that isn't thinking about the needs of the musicians. And so that's like, when I think about like what solutions get offered for musicians, that's a frame, that's a lens that I'll apply to it and say, is that gonna disrupt that dynamic? Is it gonna actually empower musicians? Or is it just gonna provide another avenue and another tricky path that they can follow and if they can learn how all of those hoops work, then maybe they can get a chance at like a percentage of like a 0.04% of something um, that they're supposed to be getting, that everybody is supposed to be paying you from the beginning. Um, that's not a kind of system that I wanna to continue to support. And so that was the last piece. Uh, first of all, thank you, Jean. All, all of that was great. All right. uh, before I start, I just want to jump in and say something. I said a lot about what the internet wasn't, and, but I didn't say uh, anything about what it is, because this is important. At the end of the day, what is a computer? It's a math machine, right? The thing, one of the things that Jean touched on, and it was really interesting, the, the kind of blood of the digital world is data. And for those, those of us who don't think in terms of data, that can be very kind of scary and daunting, but it's actually the most important thing. Without the data, there is, no, there is, there is nothing. That includes your money, right? So on, just on a really basic basis, all people who record, there is something called metadata. That's the data that go that you put in with your tracks. That if you do not, if you do not uh, take that step to be clear about your metadata, you will not get paid. Or even beyond that, this uh, I'm going to I'm going to go on the weeds a little bit. One of the one of the initiative. Oh, the organization is now called Artist Rights Collective. That used to be called um, Content Creators Coalition. One of the things that. Uh, was one of my uh, main focuses when I was involved. It, it was uh, in Europe they have uh, an addition. To, European copyright is, is different than American copyright. They have an additional set of rights which are called moral rights. And we can, we're not going to go into the weeds about whether we should have them or not or that that's, that's not relevant. What's relevant is that one of these moral rights is called attribution which is the right to be known. And in our, if you want to be known, you will not get paid unless you are known. If you just send a file out there with no metadata, it's, it's, you're just giving money to Facebook, right? So you have to start thinking in terms of, of making sure the da your data has data. And in addition, the, the great thing about the internet is the kind of things that Gene was showing us where if somebody tells you, we now we know the math, you know, which is why transparency is so important. Now they can't, no one can tell you they don't have the math. They have the math. They, all they can tell you is we're not gonna give it to you. All right, all right. So I'm gonna pass it to Gene. And that actually underscores for me um, and connects to something that Melvin was saying earlier is that the internet is global your music is getting played in France. Your music is playing in a lot of other places. All the complicated systems that I was talking about were just for the US. And so you multiply that by the number of countries that are actually using your music. It's, it's really daunting. And I think that underscores the importance of the trusted intermediaries, like the ASCAPs, uh, BMIs and CSAC in the US and the, and the union. Um, Local 802 is great, but the, the American Federation of Musicians and then also Sound Exchange. They're the ones who interpret kind of how the laws in other countries uh, get translated uh, to the U.S. And, and the money that has to go to U.S. musicians. And so um, I agree. It's really complex. I think that understanding that there are differences between regions is critical. Metadata is a lot of different things. Um, but yes, the IR ISRC and ISWC are two things that artists if they get that right, then sometimes that can help make things easier, but there are different ways to provide that information. Um, so yes, the ISRC is a registration. You register your work. 
um, uh, for your recording and you let them know who played on it and who did things and then they give you a unique number so that way when people want to pay you, they can use that unique number to know how to connect with you even if the information is not correct. ISWC does the same thing for writers. There's a lot of problems with the system. Uh, it's not entirely consistently used. They, they make mistakes. There's nobody who actually has a database of all the ISRC numbers, but it is a system that has been proposed. And it's okay if me and Jean have different opinions about this because the world is a big place. Uh, <laughs> I've agreed with everything you said so far. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to agree with this. So, uh, no, the, the internet is not mostly used as a marketing device. The internet is a device to make money, you know. So it, uh, the question is, when you interface with these companies that are designed to make money in the way they are designed to make money, how will you use them to make money the way you make money? That, that's the question. So, in other words, Facebook is going to make money no matter what you do. You put up a picture of a cat, you put, up, you, you put up your gig, you put up your son's graduation picture. They, no matter what piece of thing that they math, turn into a mathematical equation, it doesn't matter what it is, they will make the same money off of it. And you will make no money off of it. So the question becomes, what do you do once you know that? So once you know that, you think about the things that Facebook becomes useful to you for so that you can continue doing what it is you need to do. And for some people, that will be marketing. Some people might decide, like for instance, my, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going way off topic, but I just have to tell you all this just because my sister is a retired New York City police officer. She has, she has never been on Facebook. <laughs> and that's because there's a whole nother... Uh, reason to think about this thing when she turned out to be right, which is there's a whole privacy part of this that you have to think about. And her, as being a paranoid ex-law enforcement officer, refused to get on Facebook. And she was right. But we're all on there. I, I feel differently about it because I'm a public person. People know what I'm doing anyway. They know where I am. You know, so it's not like it's going to stay secret. So for me, I made that calculation and said, OK, to the extent that people are going to know where I am anyway, I'll interface with this system. I don't use Messenger because I don't want them to have access to that information. So these are different levels of how you interface with uh, these platforms. Jean, you want to jump in here? Because I don't want to turn I into agree. a conspiracy thing. No, no, no. I agree. I think that the important question that I'm hearing is like thinking as Melvin's business person. Um, wh what is the line that you draw between what you do to get exposure and what you do because you, what you know is valuable and maybe you shouldn't give away for free? And so that's the fundamental yes, question exactly. that I see when you're yes. thinking, thinking about the internet as marketing. Sure, I think that you can reach people that way, but I think that understanding what it is about what you produce that has value to people and being able to protect that value is the responsibility of an artist as they look at the opportunities. I talked a little bit about that. I mean, the big picture thing is everything is a partnership now. You know, and what, depending on what level of the business you're on, that, that partnership, if you're telling, if you're Taylor Swift, it's one kind of partnership. If you're one of us, it's another kind of partnership. But uh, it's no longer you go to a label and they give you a big pot of money and you sign everything away. And that's actually, in, that's because it's no longer in their interest to give you a big pot of money. And, which is, and because it's no longer in their interest to give you a big pot of money, they have decided to give some rights back. But as I was saying earlier, uh, and maybe you saw some of Gene's presentation, you have all of these different organizations that are in between you and whatever money you are due. And as she said, it is always in their interest to make sure you don't get that information. The only way you have any leverage to force that information is if it's actually your property that they have to deal with. So that was, that was, that was the point that I was making about that. But to answer your question, it's, it's, the business has changed. It's, it's a partnership, usually 50-50 in some variety. You know, you may get an advance if you're a large act. You, your 50-50 looks different. 
uh, a lot of most, uh, she has interesting slides about how you make money in, you know. Uh, my friend, my, you know, the younger generation people, you know, that I've mentored or who are in the hip hop world, out the vast majority of their money, in, in, in the vast majority of them who are rappers who are making money, they are making money doing things other than music. Yes, they were doing, they're doing sponsorships, of which if you sign to a major, the major will go search out a sponsorship and or take half of it. So the half goes, that's where the half becomes funny. Because if you, if you, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to switch around. This, and this goes into the question of what are the new sources of income. What popped into my head now is a sponsored post on Instagram. You know what I mean? It's, uh, do, you, do, you know, do you guys know about that? Yeah, so if you assign to a major and you're a rapper, they're going to try to get half of your sponsored post money. But in, res in, in addition, they will go search out. It is also their job to go find you somebody to, to sponsor the post. So this is, this is, this, this is this, this partnership idea. So that's kind of where we are. with the, that's, I, I don't know if that's helpful to you. Is that, is that a better question? Maybe Jane can jump in on this. Well, the one thing that I would add to it is that um, if you're thinking about going into a relationship with a label, really good thinking that you can do in advance of entering into those kinds of conversations is understanding what is it that you do that people connect with and who are the people who connect with you? Like developing fans and knowing why the fans are connecting with you and what they're interested in hearing more of, I think is something where an artist can have leverage with a label if they understand that better. The artist is best positioned to be able to understand that. Even if you play to a room with three people in it, those people came for a reason. You can talk to them and learn about that. And so I feel like before looking for partners, understanding what you have is, can give you more power in those negotiations. And just to piggyback on what she said, if you looked at the slide, and I don't, you know, we're all, you know, uh, a lot of us in our world are educators in some form or, or variety, some variety of educators. I saw that, you know, that's a large percentage for the jazz musician in general. That is a source Again, talking about what you should give away and what you shouldn't give away. If that's what you're making your money on, then that's not necessarily the thing you give away. You know, so it's just thinking about it that way. And I would also add to that is that like you can also think about what is it that a label can provide to you that you cannot figure out how to do on your own. So is it about having access to capital? Is it about logistics and distribution? Is it about being able to source uh, like sponsorship or different kinds of alignments for what you're doing, um, and is it because they can do marketing? I mean, because you can, if, if you know what it is that you need that you can't get for yourself or you don't already have somebody doing it, you may not, the answer may not be that you need a label. Maybe the answer is that you need a really good publicist and you can self-release your own stuff. So I think that answering those kinds of questions before you enter into conversations can also give you more power. Uh, before, let, let me jump on this before. Uh, and we'll go to you, sir, because this, this, is, this goes to a very important point, which is the pros and cons of self-releasing versus partnering up. Uh, in this era, we have to be social media mavens. We have to know all about publishing. We have to know about all of these things that we didn't have to know about. So the question becomes, which things are you good at and which things are you not good at? And that's, an, that's part of the equation where the, when you decide if you want to partner up with somebody or you want to do it yourself, you know. Well, this is, this is where it goes back to the transparency issue, and which is why you know, the organization that Gene was a part of stressed that so much. They know. <laughs> the Spotify knows what's going on right now. They know who's listening, how much. They know why. They know not why. They know the timing, which they can, from that, they can extrapolate a lot of things. Uh, I'm not up on the very latest about how much Spotify, information Spotify is sharing about that, but they, they are sharing a lot more than they used to. Um, and this, I guess the point is, this is why it goes back to being, uh, when you're selling from your own site, then you can find out that information. You know, When you're selling from Spotify's side, I mean, I'm sure they tell us what people know everything. Maybe if you're an artist that doesn't have that kind of power, you're not going to necessarily get to that information. 
I totally agree that the data piece is really critical. And you know, there are tools that are starting to get developed for artists so they can take more advantage of it and use it as an input that can help them. Um, you know, Pandora's experimented with dashboards um, uh, in terms of uh, people using that site. Bandcamp is great because the artists have complete control and have access to all the information. If you want to support artists, going to platforms where you know they have more control and kind of interacting with their work that way can give them the data points that Spotify isn't necessarily going to share. I'm going to let you know, Gene come in on this. My, just a couple of big bucket things. I think that Gene's point about you know hectoring people in terms of why they should pay us for music, I think that if you're going to organize, it's it has to you know I always felt like the thing that was Facebook's Achilles heel in the beginning was a privacy thing. I felt like that was the thing that was going to make them fall down. So because that's that's an issue that everybody can relate to, not just us. The thing I think for us as musicians, which is the thing I always say, we are, and I have noted that down, we are kind of the canaries in the coal mine for this gig economy thing. We already know what it looks like when our business gets platformed. You know, you ha we had this thing where you had Uber drivers committing suicide last year. This is what happens when their business gets platformed. This is going to happen to everybody. It's, you know, doctors are going to be next. You know, no, I mean, you, for real. I mean, I talk to people who, who work in AI. I mean, if I was a doctor, I'd be looking for another line of work right now because their thing, they're, they're about to get their asses kicked. One thing that I'd offer in terms of, uh, I think that there is a lot of collective work that can be done. That water is typically carried by the unions and on a national level would include like ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC and Sound Exchange and the Recording Academy. There are a bunch of folks out there. Some of them represent both artists and labels, artists and publishers, and so they're not always going to be the best artist advocates. Others are just working on behalf of artists. And so there are a number of places where people can plug in if they want to make a difference. I can offer a local example of organizing that's happening. Um, there's a group called the New York City Artists Coalition that's working to put together a platform of demands for the city for uh, independent artists and DJs. Um, and it would be a platform of demands of things that the city can actually do. Uh, and they're starting to get organized right now. And um, I think that probably Arts for Arts is going to be a part of that. And so, you know, you'll have representatives that are there. But, you know, they're going to be talking to the Department of Cultural Affairs. And they're going to be talking to the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. And they're going to be talking to different city council people about what can be done to support artists. And they're also going to be looking at the work that's, uh, they're also going to be looking at the new mayoral, mayoral candidates and ways to put pressure on them and raise the voice of individual artists in New York City. So that's an example of, of some of that work that's happening locally. And if you want to get plugged in, then, you know, I think that Patricia knows a lot about those kinds of things. And so there, there are ways to get that information. Can I just mention two questions? Quick things. I don't know if you guys are going to talk about funding, but for women, um, I don't know if you know about the new uh, media, Mayor's Office for Media and Entertainment. They have a new fund for women musicians, people, women who are working in music. It's like $20,000 for a project um, that's open right now, or it's going to be open next month. And so that's something to look out for if you're looking for funding from the city. And another one is Jazz Road, which I think most people might know about, but their deadline is going to be coming up soon. And that's around touring and recording and residency projects in the United States. And that's like direct funding for working jazz musicians that I wanted to make sure. Jazz Road. Uh, I'm going to piggyback on, this is, this is like a good, uh, we, we, we could do this as a duo, this is good. Yeah. Uh, piggyback on, on local organizing. Um, I'm going to talk personally. The people in my building, uh, which is a group, I guess, a core group of like 25 of them that around, literally around the state, are the people who spearheaded getting the law flow passed through New York State. And they're all veterans of the Dumbo uh, housing wars. And 
The point being, on the local level, you can make things happen. You don't actually need a lot of people, but you, to organ you need a core group of people who's going to carry the water through. As somebody who's been on that side of things, I, I see it differently. And uh, I mean, when de Blasio was running for mayor, he came to my building. He gave a speech for my building. It's kind of like, that's the level. I mean, the, the, Congress, the, 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 the councilman calls my house. He's, you know, when it's election time, like, hello, Mr. Gibbs, how are you doing? It, it, no. This is when you have, when you organize locally, you can get things done. In the context of the city of New York, I was also part of the, uh, I'm one of the people they spoke to when they did their cultural, the, you know, the report they gave out last year. Yeah, I'm, 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 they came to my house and we talked for like two hours. Uh, I went to a bunch of meetings. We're dealing with something that, in the context of uh, advocacy, I call the speed of, of legislature. You're talking, if you want to try to change a law, you're talking about a five, 10 year, 20 year, 30 year process. When I went to DC uh, five years ago, I met Duke Fakir from the Four Tops. He has been working on getting a rail to royalty from back when they were popular. You were talking about something that might not happen before. If you have a baby, the kid might be out of college by the time the law gets changed. But what you can do is organize locally and get things you know, done. You can get things moving, but you can also have to deal, again, deal, thinking in terms of capitalism. We deal with real estate. Uh, you, you, you have ways of pressuring people to do what you need them to do in a particular circumstance. But in thinking of terms of getting a law change to get to accomplish your purpose, I think that that's, I mean, you know, if, if, you're, if, if, you're, gonna, if you're really going to take this seriously, yeah, locally you can. Like I said, my, in my building we did. And as a matter of fact, we got it extended and they added five years to it. You can do it if you can, if you can pinpoint the person and you can get the person on the phone. That's when it becomes almost like, that's why, you know, I'm not going to go there. But uh, the people you can get on the phone are the people you can affect. And you can get your assembly person on the phone. You can get your, you can get your council person on the phone. These people who, who it's job, whose job it is to come and, and deal with you on that level, that's your, that's your starting point. Thank you so much. It's so important. I think it's so important for more people than who are here. And that's why we're really going to keep this, um, we're going to put this on our blog on, and uh, we'll try to share it via the internet <laughs> because this is a good way, this is the appropriate use of it. Um, this is something we want to give away, information that gives people power. So um, we're going to start. So thank you, and I'm going to make some more coffee, and then we're going to start with the second part of panels. <laughs>